I address you all tonight for who you truly are. Wizards, mermaids, travelers, adventurers, and magicians. You are the true dreamers. Hello, magpies. A year ago to this day, I began this YouTube channel. And to celebrate this magnificent milestone, I want to share with you my most popular homebrew creation. The magical descendants of the Netherees, the Halruans. In ancient history, long before the calendar of Dale Reckoning began, a great empire of magic users known as Netheril, ruled over northern Faerun. For them, atop their magical flying cities, the arcane arts were a mundane part of life. But they reached too high, they delved too deep, and when the archmage Cassus tried to kill the god of magic, their empire vanished as their cities fell from the sky. The scar of their folly reshaped the weave of magic, and the effects of Netheri's civilization resound throughout the history of Faerun. Where their kingdom once lay, now a frozen desert encroaches a little more every year. A sickness that shall one day swallow up the entire world. The golden age of magic is undone, but its echoes thrum along the threads of fate. Yet a few scattered refugees foresaw the cataclysm and escaped to the shining south settling in a hidden kingdom which they named Haurua. Protected on all sides by impassive mountain ranges, these last descendants of the Netherese bloodline mixed their culture with that of the Shining South to become a thriving, wealthy civilization, ruled by magic users and protected by a powerful fleet of airships. Though they have adapted to match the climate of their new home, vestigial race, uh, traces of their heritage remain. By their language, which is a pidgin version of Loros, an ancient Netherese language, and by the magic that courses through the veins of all how ruins, and of course by the ancient tradition that this magic shall decide each individual's path throughout life. Though Halruans were once physically similar to their northern cousins, centuries of intermingling with the native jungle-dwelling Lapal tribes have caused Halruans to become shorter in height. Their skin tones range from pale olive to rich brown. Their hair is dark and their eyes are brown or green. Their clothing is loose and flowing, sporting many bright colors, such that to an uninformed outsider they might easily be mistaken for an inhabitant of Kalimshan. The Hellruin reliance upon magic has caused them to become, on average, physically weaker and in some cases more complacent than other Faerunian humans. When creating your, your Hellruin character, this means that you may add a single plus one to a single ability score of your choice. Nonetheless, the Hellruins retain the spark of inspiration and the insatiable curiosity that has caused the human race to thrive. And therefore you gain proficiency in one extra skill and you gain one bonus feat. Your starting languages are common and Halruan. 
And many hell ruins tend to gravitate towards neutral good, lawful neutral, and lawful good alignments. But by all other measures, such as lifespan, size category, and walking speed, hell ruins are indistinguishable from other humans. Except that hell ruins, upon reaching adolescence, gain the ability to cast some limited form of magic that determines their chosen profession throughout their life, which in Halruin society is called their fated path. This means that whatever background you choose for your Halruin character will grant you a magical ability that you can cast at will as a cantrip. The athlete background grants the ability to cast the guidance cantrip, but only upon yourself and only affecting strength, dexterity, and constitution based ability checks. The charlatan, the courtier, the gambler, and the urchin backgrounds all grant the friends cantrip. While criminals, spies, faction agents, and grinners, which I have reskinned as harpers, can all cast encode thoughts. Entertainers, phalost, gladiators, and some actively proselytizing acolytes can cast thaumaturgy. Failed merchants and smugglers can cast minor illusion. Limited to creating and modifying appearances of inanimate objects. While Outlanders can also cast Minor Illusion. Limited to animal mimicry and creating the false image of small prey to lure predators. The Fisher background grants Dancing Lights. Limited to a single orb of light typically used as a fishing lure, while folk heroes can cast Spare the Dying, but only on heroes and innocent civilians. Guild artisans and guild merchants can cast Prestidigitation, creating a single fixed effect agreed upon by you and your DM, and relating to your specific trade skill. Whilst nobles can also cast prestidigitation, but only as it relates to grooming and self-care. Hermits can cast druidcraft. Inheritors can cast locate object as a cantrip, but only upon a single heirloom that forms their inheritance. Knights and Knights of the Order can cast True Strike. Mercenary veterans and soldiers can cast Mending, though only as it relates to weapon and armor care and maintenance, including de-rusting and sharpening. While shipwrights can also cast mending, but only upon wooden objects. Pirates and sailors can cast gust. Sages can cast a message. And finally, I have created three new cantrips to complement other backgrounds. Academics such as acolytes, anthropologists, archaeologists, cloistered scholars, is it engineers, which I have reskinned as inventors, plaintiffs, which I have reskinned as scribes, and simic scientists, reskinned as natural philosophers, can all cast Scribo, which is a transmutation cantrip that requires an action to cast, has a range of 10 feet, has verbal, somatic, and material components, including paper, a quill, and ink and is a concentration spell that lasts up to 10 minutes. It causes a quill to animate and to record everything that is spoken out loud within range at the speed at which it is spoken. The caster may restrain the quill with their hand to omit details, 
And if multiple people within range are speaking at once, it will only scribble gibberish. The City Watch, the Investigator, and the Urban Bounty Hunter backgrounds all grant Limino, an evocation cantrip that requires an action to cast. It affects the caster alone, it has verbal and somatic components, and it lasts for an hour. It causes light to shine forth from the caster's palm creating bright light in a 20-foot radius and dim light for another 20 feet. The caster chooses which hand to illuminate and ends the spell by making a fist. Firmly gripping anything with that hand, such as a weapon or a shield, will also end the spell, but casting spells does not affect the light source. And finally, the Witchlight Hand background, which I have reskinned as a soothsayer, can cast Precanto, a divination cantrip that has a casting time of one minute and affects one creature that is touched during the casting. It has verbal, somatic, and material components, including a crystal ball, tarot card, rune stones or other objects of divination and it has a duration of one hour. By reading the target's fortunes the caster chooses to give them a positive or a negative prediction or the player may flip a coin if they wish. On a positive fortune, the target may add a d4 to the result of one ability check that they make within the next hour, much like a guidance spell. However, if the fortune is negative, they must subtract a d4 from the next ability check that they pass within an hour. The caster may not target themselves, and they may have only one target affected by this spell at a time. And obviously the spell ends when the d4 is expended. Finally, as an addendum, consider the above list of spells and backgrounds as a general guide and work with your DM to create a thematic magical talent that aids in your character's profession. For example, an acolyte of Kossuth the Fire Lord might be able to cast Control Flames if your DM agrees. Magic has enhanced Halruin's society to cause them to become the envy of their neighbours. This combined with the fact that they were founded by refugees fleeing a cataclysm has led to their culture to become quite insular, and many travelling Halruans are loath to reveal their identity to outsiders, lest greedy adventurers come in search of the lost treasures of Natharil. Halruan airships are the pride of their nation, and their first line of defence against intruders, with their crew of airmen occupying a similar position to chivalric knights in the cultural imaginations of Halrua. On the ground, social status is often decided by magical ability. Communities are protected and guided by learned wizards, and those with stronger magical gifts tend to rise to the top of their professions. While curiously, the divisions between working class and middle class labour is blurred, such that a highly skilled magical blacksmith would occupy a, ho a higher social status than a goldsmith of mediocre magical talents, while those with limited or no magical skills are well, they're not second-class citizens by any measure, but the discrimination they face is more subtle, being a slow weight of microaggressions and an implied sense of inadequacy. The exception to this rule is that 
Sorcerers are generally distrusted in Halruan society, which is ironic, given that nearly all citizens manifest magical talents through their bloodlines. But given the importance, the weight placed upon these talents, it is somewhat understandable that power without temperance may be viewed as a threat to society. The worship of Mistra, the goddess of magic, is so interwoven into society that she is almost taken for granted. The largest formal church, therefore, is the Loom Weavers, being followers of Azuth, the god of spellcasters. They also recognize Savras, the god of fate, but only by his subordinate status to Azuth as a tool wielded by the Lord of Spells. The worship of Velsharun, the god of necromancy, is also present below Azuth, but he is understandably given less prominence. Other faiths are discouraged from taking hold among the populace, but this has not prevented a cult of Sha, the goddess of the night, from taking hold and she tempts sorcerers and those with less magical talents through promises of community and of power through her dark shadow magic. The loom weavers are intimately involved in the creation of fine and magical fabrics that Halruar is famous for. Beside their precious metals of gold and electrum and their Hairlu wine, Philosophically, loom weavers view Halruan society through the lens of weaving cloth. Each thread is interlaced, and each is within its own place, supporting all others. They also oversee a yearly rite known as the Becoming, being the most important stage in a young Halruan's life whereby their fated path manifests. It is something akin to a job fair, whereby youths freely mingle with professionals of every trade skill, both to arrange apprenticeships should their magical talents have already begun to manifest, or for late bloomers it is a chance to try to coax their magic to the surface by wandering aimlessly to find what craft they are drawn towards. In my world, the nation of Halrua is no more. But the Halruan people have become intimately embroiled in the politics of the north. The great mountain ranges that survive that surround the hidden nation were in fact the mouth of an enormous volcano which erupted in the year 1451 after a pirate king corrupted by shadow magic conquered Halrua and tried to summon an ancient evil into the world. The only survivors of this eruption were those who managed to cluster aboard their fleet of airships and they followed their saviors the Wyvern Spurs being the rulers of the Sunset Vale, back to the Western Heartlands. Upon arrival, the Halruan refugees dismantled their fleet of flying ships in exchange for full citizenship in the new nation of the Sunset Vale, and they have become extremely productive members of society which has caused some tension with native inhabitants who may not always appreciate the ease with which Halruans become hyper-specialized experts in trading skills. Nonetheless, the demand for Halruan goods has skyrocketed across the western heartlands, causing them to fit neatly into the system of trade guilds known as the Hanseatic League that wields considerable power across the region. 
Yet life as an immigrant refugee in a strange land is not without difficulties. And, and in the two decades following their arrival, the Halruan people have come to stand at a crossroads between assimilation and the preservation of their culture. The new generation tends towards more chaotic alignments, embracing the native Tathirian notions of freedom and of adventure that fly in the face of their parents' strict work ethics. Some have even taken to adopting professions that are actively in conflict with their fated paths. The Church of the Loom Weavers survives, however, within the fortress city of Luthvar in the northern Sunset Vale, and it continues the yearly rite of the becoming. But this day has taken on a different context for its participants in a strange land. For within Northwestern Faerun, it is not the skill of the artist, but the medium in which they work that decides their social status. A blacksmith may work his entire life and have nothing but scars upon his hands and crippling poverty to show for it while a goldsmith is almost guaranteed to retire in luxury. Therefore, the becoming is less a time for a youth to find themselves and more of a time for parents to pressure their choices on two fronts. Firstly, that this right, it literally represents the survival of their culture against extinction. And secondly, that the profession that they choose, that they are drawn towards, may well determine what generations of their family, what their fate shall become. Will they retire in comfort or die in poverty? Worse still is that the foreign ways of Halruans prevent, uh, present a convenient scapegoat for religiously conservative outsiders to rail against the new heretical faiths that have taken root in the Sunset Vale. For it is always easier to explain heterodoxy as being the products of outside agitators rather than to confront the material conditions that cause new generations to reject the old ways. Especially when those ways deliver outcomes of old power reinforcing itself, in contrast to the empty promises of a new generation, one day inheriting the earth. Thank you, magpies. And I'm looking forward to another year of making videos for your enjoyment. Maybe, maybe even some live streaming. We'll see how we go. And despite how infrequently I reply to your comments, you should know always that I love you all so very much. And as always, swoop on.